The unfortunately named William the Scabby was taken out to be hanged near Swansea Castle in Wales on the 27th of November 1290. The rebel had been sentenced to death because he had supported Lord Rhys Ab My Dud in his uprising against King Edward I of England. William was hanged, quote, until dead, removed from the gallows, and carried away. However, later that day, although nine witnesses would testify that William was dead, he was miraculously restored to life. Let's travel back in time now to the late 13th century to find out about a hundred cows measuring the saint and a not-so-hanged man. And now for a quick message from our sponsor, me. I come to you once again with a shameless plug for my own band's new single. The response you guys gave for the last one was so nice and overwhelmingly kind, and I really, really appreciate that everyone checked it out and left nice comments. We have a new single that's coming out today as this video goes live. I'll try and keep this short and sweet, but my band is called Default Mode Network, and this new song is called Blueberry Hill. When I'm not busy working on these medieval videos, I sing and play guitar with my own original songs. The only reason I'm mentioning it here is the more streams, saves, and being put in playlists that we can get, the more ears the track will be pushed out to on Spotify and other streaming services. So, for any fans of guitar or rock music, please do check us out using the link down below, and if you do, let me know what you think. Cheers again everyone, and now for today's video. Welcome to Medieval Madness. In 1307, an inquiry began into whether the Bishop of Hereford, Thomas de Cantilupe, should be regarded as a saint. Cantilupe had died 25 years earlier, and it was up to the three commissioners who had been sent by Pope Clement V to weigh up the evidence and find out what sort of a man the bishop was, and more importantly, what miracles he had performed after his death, an essential part of the procedure when recognising a saint. Three of the witnesses to be heard were Mary de Bios, her stepson William, and their family chaplain. They all gave evidence concerning a Welshman by the name of William Cragg. It was claimed that William had been miraculously brought back to life because of the intervention of Bishop Cantaloupe. Rebel Rebel William Cragg was born around 1262 in the Goa Peninsula. Between the years 1282 and 83, King Edward I of England conquered Wales, but later faced resistance from Rhys Ab Myrdud. At one time an ally of the king, Medud now launched a rebellion against him. The uprising was soon crushed, and although Medud remained at large, some of his supporters were captured, including William Cragg. William was taken prisoner in 1290 by the son of William de Bures, the Lord of Goa. Cragg, one of 14 prisoners, was taken to Swansea Castle to await trial. Accused of arson and the killing of 13 men, William was held in the dungeons by de Bures Sr. Twelve of the fourteen prisoners were released, except for William and another malefactor named Trehen Ab Hewell. William, who only spoke Welsh, was questioned for fifteen days and said he wasn't sure of his age, although he thought he was about forty-five years old. Despite William's claims of innocence, he was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. At that time, hanging was the main method of execution in England. It was the law in Wales at the time that condemned men could atone for their crimes by paying money to their victims or their victim's family. William's family pulled together and offered de Beers a hundred cows for his release, but the proposal was refused. Such a large tender of compensation would indicate that William was a wealthy man, or at least came from a wealthy family. Hang em high. The execution site was on a high hill about a quarter of a mile outside of the town of Swansea in the site of the castle. William and his fellow Welshman, Traian Ap Hywel, were dressed in shirts, breeches, and tunics, and William was led out to the gallows in the early morning at 7.30am by three members of his family, including an uncle and a cousin. In a cruel act, de Bruse had forced William's kinfolk to participate in his execution. The noose was already around William's neck, and he had to carry the length of rope that would be used for the hang. Later, at the inquiry, William would say that his noose was, quote, thicker than the knot that the Franciscans usually have on their belts. Afraid that William's family might attempt a rescue, the steward, John of Bagaham, had gathered together ten mounted armed guards to oversee the proceedings. William was hanged first, he climbed up to the gallows on a ladder, the rope was tied on, and William was turned off by his kinsman, Ithil Fashion, as the ladder was pulled away. 
This left William dangling by the rope that had been thrown over the crossbeam. Trahan was simply pulled off the ground by throwing a rope over the beam. The men were left there to swing, but Trahan was a large and heavy man who struggled hard, and the gallows collapsed under his weight. With both men now fallen to the ground dead, Trahan was taken away for burial. However, De Brios ordered that William be strung up again from the remaining arm of the scaffold. Because, quote, he was a very famous and public malefactor and as an insult to his kin. Witnesses said that William had let loose his bladder and bowels whilst hanging there, a sure sign that the man was dead. Sure that the Welshman was deceased, Bagaham went up to Swansea Castle to report the death of the two men to his lord. While he was there, Bagaham said that Lady Mary asked for the body of William, but he had no idea why. William's body was carried away on the ladder up which he had climbed to the gallows. His family took him to the house of Thomas Matthew in Swansea, where the young William de Brieux found the body stretched out on the floor, quote, in the way that a dead man lies. The young lord reported that, quote, Crag's face was black and in parts bloody or stained with blood. His eyes had come out of their sockets and hung outside the eyelids, and the sockets were filled with blood. His mouth, neck, and throat, and the parts around them, and also his nostrils were filled with blood so that it was impossible in the natural course of things for him to breathe. His tongue hung out of his mouth the length of a man's finger, and it was completely black and swollen, and as thick with the blood sticking to it that it seemed the size of a man's two fists together. It's a miracle. When her stepson returned and reported on the state of William's body, Lady Mary stated, quote, This man has been hanged twice and suffered a great penalty. Let us pray to God and St. Thomas de Cantaloupe that he give him life, and if he give him life, we will conduct him to St. Thomas. During his lifetime, Thomas de Cantaloupe was a Bishop of Hereford and a trusted advisor of King Edward I, who made him Lord Chancellor of England. He was also a raging anti-Semite. Cantaloupe was in Italy on his way to Rome to see the Pope in 1282 when he died. His flesh was boiled from his bones and they were sent back to England to be buried. They were taken to Hereford Cathedral where his cult quickly grew. Cantaloupe was not officially recognized as a saint by the Pope, although tales of numerous miracles attach pilgrims to the cathedral, the incoming bishop, Richard de Swineford, reporting that, quote, The blind recover their sight there, the lame walk, and the dead rise again. Lady Mary, as it turned out, was a distant relative of Cantaloupe, and being familiar with the area, it's no surprise that she chose him as her champion. Using one of the practices involved in the veneration of a saint, Lady Mary sent her lady-in-waiting to measure William's body with a piece of cord. The cord was then dipped in wax to make a candle, the same length as the person in need of help. This process was known as measuring the saint, and meant that William's spiritual care was now in the hands of Thomas de Cantaloupe. Then Lady Mary, quote, bent a silver penny over William's head according to the custom of England, as another way of entrusting him into the saint's care. Despite Lady Mary's invocations, William still lay dead. All she could do now was wait. Now it was up to the saint, and he didn't disappoint, according to Brios Jr., quote, After William had been measured, he remained in the same state until around the middle of the night, and then began to breathe in and out and to move a leg. The chaplain William, another William, of Coddingston, stated that, quote, after William had been measured, not immediately, but after an hour or so, he moved his tongue a little, and after another space of time, moved a foot, and afterwards gradually began to recover strength in his limbs. Everyone agreed that William's recovery took time, the chaplain confirming that the man was frail for 8 or 10 days, and it was 15 days before he was able to walk without help. Although on the fourth day of his recovery, he was much improved, quote, in the state of his tongue, eyes, and throat, but still unable to speak or see. He could only eat soup, which was prepared for him by Lady Mary herself. When he was at last able to speak, William was summoned before Lord and Lady Briores at Swansea Castle. He must have been terrified that he was going to be hanged again, and the chaplain de Coddingston stated that William was filled with, quote, great fear and apprehension. William stated that while he was sleeping in the dungeon on the morning of his execution, he had a vision of the Virgin Mary in the presence of a lordly figure, so he prayed to Thomas de Cantaloupe to save him. Then a heavenly bishop wearing white garments supposedly came down and supported him by holding up his body while he was on the gallows. 
Who knows whether William was being truthful and had really experienced this vision, or just felt that he needed to go along with the story to save his skin. Once he had recovered enough to travel, William went on a pilgrimage with Lord and Lady Briose to Hereford to give thanks to St. Cantaloupe for saving his life. Wearing the rope that he had been hanged with, he walked barefoot for the three days that it took to reach the cathedral. The rope was left at the shrine, and the three parted with William promising to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Or is it? Back at the 1307 papal investigation into the saintliness of Thomas Cantaloupe, the evidence of the miracles that he had performed after his death had to be presented, and the resurrection of William Cragg was one of those miracles. Nine witnesses were heard at the inquiry, including William himself. Lady Mary de Bureaux was the first to speak. If William had not been dead when he fell from the scaffold, no miracle would have taken place, so the commissioners dug into the fine details of the case and questioned the witnesses vigorously. Dibrios Jr., his father had died by the time of the inquiry, was adamant that, quote, If any subterfuge or trickery were discovered, then the executioner himself would have been hanged in turn. He pointed out that there could be no deception, as his father hated William as the worst of malefactors. The chaplain agreed, stating that, quote, The Lord de Brios and his justices, officials, and servants hated William Cragg very much, and rejoiced greatly at his hanging and death. So what did happen to William Cragg on the scaffold? Of the 38 posthumous miracles attributed to Thomas de Cantaloupe, 12 were rejected by the papal commission, and Cragg's resurrection was one of them. No reason for its dismissal was ever given. Nothing more is known of William after his testimony. Pope John XXII announced Cantaloupe's canonization in 1320, 38 years after his death. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe if you're enjoying these videos, and as always, I'll see you next week for another one. Until then, hope everyone has an awesome week. Cheers!